All right, here we are. Welcome to the Friday q and I'm Mike Winger here to try to answer your questions about Christianity, God, Jesus, the Bible, uh, taking your questions on face value, um, seriously, thoughtfully, hopefully. And our goal here is to help you think biblically about everything. That is that your thought processes in the end, hold on, I need more light, don't I? Become biblical. You start to think the way the Bible thinks in a metaphorical sense. Um, so uh, question number one comes in from Christina Har, and I put this one off because I wanted to spend more time on it. I got it. I was asked it last time in the Q&A and I just wanted to spend more time before answering it. That happens a lot, actually. There's lots of questions you guys ask and I think, ooh, uh, boy, I wish I had 10 minutes or 30 hours to think about this first. But, you know, such is the nature of a live, you know, Q&A. So I thought I'd put this one off. So anyways, <clears throat> here's the deal. Here's a question. What does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Is that a literal statement? Thank you for your ministry, Mike. It's so appreciated and needed. And thank you, Christina, for that encouragement. Um, okay, so working out your salvation. Let's look at this. This is in Philippians 2.12. That's where the verse is. And I apologize for being uh, starting this this thing so late today. As you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm tired and rushed and um, long story, lots of stuff. But I'm doing my best. Okay, so here it is on your screen, um, Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That phrase right there causes a lot of fear and trembling in people, <laughs> understandably, right? And Because I'm with you, Christina. This is, I want to take scripture seriously. It tells me to do something with fear and trembling. I want to be like, I want to take that very seriously. So we'll look at this today. Also, verse 13, which is actually where we're going to start. I think to understand this verse, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we have to understand the reason why Paul says it, which is in verse 13. It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So think about this. God's the one working in you. Yeah, you're right. Hold on. Let me fix this for you guys. Wait, that was better. That, that's good enough right there. All right, fix the glare. Um, okay, so it's God working in you. Now, to understand um, how working out your salvation is different than working for your salvation, we, we need to look at the contrast here between the two different words for work. So one of the words is this word, what God does. He works in us. This is like uh, an ergo, I, I think, if, off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember exactly the Greek. Hold on, I can, I can double check this. I was looking at, looking at this. I'm just trying to remember what I what I looked at. In <laughs> um, ergon is the specific, yeah. In um, ergeo, in ergeo. So you, it even sounds like the English word energy, in ergeo. But this is like an, an effectual working, and it's in an active sense. God's the one who works in you. He's the one doing this work where he's like works on you and brings out an effect, an impact. And the impact is that you would have the will. Right. And then the actual actions that bring God pleasure. So God's working in you to bring out his pleasure. Now, this is a result of salvation. When you embrace Christ, as I understand, and of course, there's a debate here. I'm not going to get into the Calvinism stuff at all. But but as I understand things, um, the work that God does when you receive him, when you turn and put your trust in Jesus Christ, is this radical life change by the work of the Holy Spirit. You then begin to desire more. And to not, not just want, but to like will, maybe a bit of a stronger term, to will to do God's will, to do what pleases God. And then you start performing what pleases God as a result of his work in your life. So God is the one who's doing this big active work, transforming and changing you. So what does this mean? This word, work out your salvation. Well, you'll notice first that it doesn't say work for your salvation. In fact, in translation after translation, you could check a bunch. I did. It says work out your salvation not work for. Why is that? Uh, because this word, work out, it's um, it can be something where you're working to accomplish a goal, like say, I'm going to work to get saved. Okay, it, it could be that, it could mean that, but it's not being used in the in an active sense here. It's being used in a what's called a middle or passive sense in the Greek, and this is, there's a debate. What, was it middle or passive? That's why they say middle or passive. Well, if we take it in the middle sense, here's how we might understand it. And I think verse 13, showing God's doing the active work and I'm doing something that's a little different. Let me just read to you what middle could possibly mean. So the middle voice signifies that the subject of the verb, the subject of the verb, that's 
your salvation, is being affected by its own action or is acting upon itself. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is this is my entire grid for understanding this passage, just rather this is one little tool to help kind of like help us understand why translations keep backing off of the idea of working for your salvation, but they say work out your salvation. There's a big difference there. It's that your salvation itself can be seen as an as something that's happening to you and you are then working it out. So God's working in, another another simple way people put it is God's working in you and you're to bring this work out of you through your behavior and your actions. And this results in some sense in your salvation. And there's actually a, a, a debate on what the word salvation here means. And it could be referring to salvation in the sense of um, final salvation, like getting in, getting to heaven. We often think of it that way. But it can also refer to salvation in a very different sense. It can refer to salvation in the sense of like health and well-being of the Christian community in Philippi. And there's a case to be made for this. I'm not I'm not sure which way I take it. I'll give you how I take it. I'm not sure if I f I'm fully on board with this, but I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of merit to it. So this word salvation, there's a lot of commentaries that actually take it to mean something different than final salvation. But they take it to mean something like um, sanctification or the current work of salvation in your life, right? Like the way God's salvation, how it was purchased at the cross, you became redeemed, filled with the spirit, that's salvation then you're going to be brought to heaven, that's salvation, but you're also having a work of God in your life right now to sanctify you, to, to cleanse you, to transform your life, to bring unity to a community of Christians. That's also part of salvation. We're suggesting maybe it's that part. I think that there's a good there's a good case for this. So let me read to you some, some stuff. This is from, um, uh, let me see, who's this from? Uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown, who say, the readers are being encouraged to concentrate upon reforming their church life, working at this matter until the spiritual health of the community diseased by strife and bad feeling is restored. That's just like a overview of how they're interpreting the term salvation here. Let me give you another one to help, you know, fill this out some more. This is from another commentary. Your salvation can hardly be taken in a personal sense. In Greek, both the verb work out and the reflexive pronoun yourselves are plural. So let me show you this on your screen, right? So, um, work out is plural and your is plural. So it, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense for to think that the community here, plural is working out the salvation of the community in the final salvation sense. But it would make sense that if it's talking about sanctification, the sort of, you know, the salvation as it, as it impacts our sanctification, that, that could happen in a communal sense. Um, so let me read on. This commentary says, it is not an exhortation to the Philippian Christians to accomplish the personal salvation of the individual members. Paul is rather concerned about the well-being of their common life together as a community. Paul often uses salvation to refer to the ultimate saving act of God, which will reach its completion at the end of the world. For him, it is primarily a future reality, an attainment of final blessedness, and a deliverance from approach, approaching wrath. In the present context, however, and context is king, the word can be taken in the broader sense of restoration of health and the spiritual well-being of the community. So this is kind of the case for salvation referring to like health. Let me, let me uh, not physical health, right? But spiritual well-being, sanctification in the community as a whole. Um, for one, uh, it's not personal salvation, but corp a corporate experience of salvation within the context of Philippi as a church. So people don't get saved in groups, nor can they do anything as a group that will ensure the final salvation of other members of the group. But the group can do stuff that will result, result in their current health as a community. So there's one point in favor of that view. To further support this, um, Ephesians 2 verses 5 through 11, let's look at this. This seems to be speaking about the health of the community. At least it's inclusively talking about that. It's certainly not talking about less than that. So let me read here. Verse 5. Have this. Um, actually, I'll back up to even further. Look at what Paul's in context is addressing in Philippians 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you, now this is a corporate health and spiritual well-being, isn't it? But let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself 
by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I'm just constantly, I just want to say, side note, nothing to do with your question. <laughs> the idea that Jesus, the, okay, look at all the religions of the world and all their different sort of, the people they prop up. You, know, you can look at Muhammad, who was ultimately, was a mass murderer. You can look at Joseph Smith, who stole other men's wives. You you can look at uh, you know, David Koresh or these other religious leaders, and you can ask yourself, like, what was their model of that they that they led? And Jesus is the exemplary model. Jesus, like, it seems if you evaluate Jesus from just a purely just step back and just compare Jesus and say Muhammad or even Buddha, who mostly we don't really know much of anything about that guy really, um, and you you compare these different people, you see the radical difference that Jesus, his example is humility, giving up power obedience, love, self-sacrifice, taking upon the burdens of others, and then we're just called to follow that. And this is something, you know, it's beautiful, it's confrontive, and it's part of our sanctification. So verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, now we get to our passage, as you've always obeyed, so now, um, not only is it my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation. Work it out. Bring out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This this um, current work of God to, to, to cleanse and purify you, set you apart from the world, make you more like Christ as a community, not just as an individual. For it is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. Again, these are plurals. God working in you. Then it goes on, even more sanctification discussion. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may, became, may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. This is, again, a current concern of the impact of salvation in our lives right now, not that ultimate future final salvation. Paul does talk about it in all senses. Your initial salvation when you get saved, your ongoing work of salvation in your life, and your final salvation. Um, so there, there's part of the case for salvation. Now, uh, salvation can actually have this meaning in other places. Let me just give you some examples, actually, here, back to the Bible. Luke chapter 171. Um, this is a prophetic statement about, you know, around the birth of Jesus. And it's that we should, that we, meaning Israel, should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. This is not talking here. This saved is, oh, there you go. No, there you go. This saved here is not talking about being saved in the sense of um, eventually entering into eternal joys. He's talking about an earthly sense of being saved. And Jesus will do this for Israel when Israel turns as a, you know globally or as a nation really turns to Christ in the future. So this is going to happen. Uh, they did not receive him fully when he came first. Uh, Acts 7.25 is another example. Um, speaking of Moses, it says, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. This salvation through the hand of Moses is speaking of being delivered from slavery in Egypt. Okay, so it's not talking about eternal life here. It's talking about something different. Another example is Acts 27, verse 34. Therefore, I urge you, take some food. This is Paul talking to sailors who've been fasting because they're in distress and they feel they're going to die on the boat. And he's like, hey... Take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And um, th this is speaking of the word salvation as well. So it's the same, we have the same um, uh, basic idea that here salvation can be used in various senses. And here it's actually Paul talking, interestingly enough. Uh, another, another example is Hebrews eleven seven. By faith, Noah being warned concerning by God concerning events as unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Obviously, the ark did not spiritually save them, not the physical ark, not what Noah built. Um, and so this is about them being physically saved, not spiritually saved. Did I mix up those words? Forgive me if I did. You know what I mean. All right, so there's there's some examples. Uh, Paul does this in Philippians 1.19, actually. Here's a really interesting one. In the book, now normally, okay, usually when salvation comes up, it is talking about that spiritual sense more often than not. I'm just giving you some examples so you know that there's there's a wedge of possibility there. But here, Philippians 119, for 
this is Paul writing in the same book of Philippians, just before chapter two, he says, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my, and it's translated deliverance here, but it is the same word in the, in the, in the Greek. It comes from the word soter ultimately, um, but it means salvation. And so, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Okay. I'm just going to suggest this, that it's at least possible that Paul is talking about salvation in a sort of, um, focused sense about communal health and spiritual well-being of godly Christians living together and representing Christ with one another and to the world. I think that that's quite possible that that's being talked about here. But even if Paul's talking about salvation in the ultimate sense, I still think that Philippians 2, 12 is ruled. Well, there's a few pointers I'll just point out real quickly. First off, work out doesn't have to be effectual. Um, and most translations don't take it that way, that it's, it's more like it's your salvation is being played out, uh, being drawn out in your lives, in 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 the work that you're doing, and he wants them to do that to work work it out, not work for it, but work it out. Also, it's being compared to the work that God does, which is clearly effectual, providing a real contrast between the kind of work you're doing, a res it's sort of a result of, versus the work God is doing, which is that's the thing causing you to be able to even do work for Him. And then, of course, we have the fact that salvation may be really focused on the idea of sanctification here, which is something you very much participate in, right? You're not earning anything here, you're, but you are participating. There's a difference between earning and participating. Um, and um, let me just add real quick, fear and trembling here. We, we sometimes read this passage and we think fear and trembling is meant to say, um, you, you Christians should be scared that at any moment you're like, maybe I'm not saved, maybe I'm not saved. And while there's a real sober attitude you should have about whether you're really a Christian or not, whether you really mean it or not, I don't think we're just supposed to have an attitude of what you think of in English, what you're probably thinking of in your head, as fear and trembling as a general state of mind regarding whether I'm going to go to heaven. <sighs> Am I going to go to heaven? I don't know. I'm totally scared. I don't think that's what it's saying. The word fear and trembling is used in a number of places in the Bible to refer to simply um, full awareness of the importance or seriousness of a thing reverence and awe, not terror and uncertainty. It's very different. Let me give you a really good example of this. So Mark 5.33, and it can be used both ways, okay? Uh, let me, maybe I'll put it this way. In in Greek and in Hebrew, in the, in the culture they have, in fact, human cultures as well until recently, fear and trembling could be used in both positive or negative ways. It could be used to refer to terror. On the other hand, it could just simply be used to refer to awe and wow and seriousness and sobriety in dealing with a big issue. So Matthew 5.33 is an example. Jesus heals this, this woman and it says, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fear and trembling, right? And fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, the thing is, what the woman knew happened to her, she went up to Jesus, I just have to touch his garment and she gets healed. This is a delightful moment. This has been a play on her life, this disease. For 12 years, she's had this, whatever it is. And she gets healed. And she comes and trembles before him. It's not um, It's not probably a, a negative fear as much as it is this incredible delight, right? She got what she came for. This is just the weight of it, the seriousness of it, the awe of it, the, the power of the moment is there. So there's a sense in which I think fear and um, trembling can be used to refer to those things. Ephesians 5, 6, or 6, 5, rather. Oops. Let's go to 6, 5. Ephesians 6, 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Now, if you take fear and trembling to be like, worry at any moment that you may be destroyed, like if that's your version of fear and trembling, then you're really going to misunderstand what Paul's saying here. He means with like respect and awareness of the role that they have and of your position with them and, and all that sort of thing. This is about um, full awareness of the importance and seriousness of a thing. It's not about being scared. That sort of horror movie kind of fear. Anyway, I hope that that helps. That, that, you know, there's a reason why translations over and over and over again will translate Philippians to work out your salvation and not for. And then there's a reason why Paul writes in Philippians 2.13 that it's God who's working in you. And this is the reason why you're going to work it out because God's working in. So you are letting the work of God manifest in your life by you yielding to the work that he's doing and becoming more sanctified and unified as a community and godly. Um, because your sanctification, your final 
sanctification in heaven, your eternal, that's all fully secure by the, by the grace and work of God entirely. But your ongoing transformation right now, it, this depends on a yielding that you need to do to the work that God's doing in your life. That, that's how I would understand it. Um, let's go to the next question. This is question two coming from a person. Um, Brandy, who says, Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus was resurrected as a spirit only, not a bodily resurrection, since he appeared in a locked room. And if he was in the flesh, he couldn't have done that. What are your thoughts in response to this? Um, let me give you one scripture that I think really strongly refutes this. Okay, so just take a moment. Um, um, I'm just trying, trying to find the text. Okay, so here we go. All right, let's look at Jesus appearing in the locked room. This is the example you gave. You're asking about this exact passage, and we're going to use this passage to prove the Jehovah's Witness theology is completely wrong here um, and dangerously wrong because it destroys people to deceive them about the nature of Jesus and the resurrection. Um, so here's a, John 20, verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. That's, that's, that's the context you're talking about, right? I think it is. The doors are shut and he stands in their midst. And he says, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas. Now remember, Thomas was a doubter. Was a doubter. He hadn't been there to see Jesus physically yet. And so Thomas is like, oh, I'm not so, so sure that I trust the testimony of other people right now. I, I won't believe unless I see him myself. I won't believe unless I unless I feel. In fact, let's, let's look at what Thomas said. We got to back up. He says, um... When they say, we've seen the Lord, Thomas responds, unless I, here we go, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Notice his his condition. It implies that Thomas is thinking that he's being requested to believe in a physical risen Christ because he won't believe unless he sees what? The print of the nails. What, were, what are the nails? Those are the nails that were on the cross. That could only be, there could, the print of the nails on the cross the marks of those nails, right? Pro probably here, I'm guessing, um, would have been only on the physical body of Jesus, the same physical body that died. So only if Jesus had the same physical body that, that died is the one that rose and the one that Thomas sees, then he'll believe them, which means that their claim is for a physical Christ. And Thomas wants physical proof that it's the same physical body of the same physical Christ. So then after eight days, Jesus appears and he tells Thomas what? Verse 27, reach your finger here and look at my hands, reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Why is he reaching his hand to put it? In? Jesus is not manifesting a spiritual appearance. He's like, you want the nail holes? They're right here. Feel them, Thomas. It's me. The same body that went into the tomb is now standing before you now. And I am risen. I have conquered death. I have overcome he is, he is risen. He is risen indeed. That This is, in fact, part of part of this, you could say, is just the, the whole Jewish concept of resurrection. It's not a resurrection if you don't have a body. The, the very nature of the resurrection is that it's bodily. So Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection, um, be, it, just the very terminology they use, that Jesus rose, they wouldn't say Jesus rose if he appeared to them in a spiritual form. They would say that he appeared to them. The way Samuel appeared to Saul in in the book of uh, Judges, First uh, Samuel, sorry, First Samuel, Second Samuel, in you know the Jews have that as one book, so I'm totally without excuse, but but I have a good excuse that I'm going to pretend is a good excuse that that this is one book for them, so it's just, it's in Samuel. At any rate, I'll remember it later when I'm not thinking about other things. Um, this is this is definitely proof. The very passage itself, take them there and say, what did Thomas want to you know walk them through with questions, nail them down. You know, cut off all avenues of escape from this glorious truth by asking things like, Thomas wanted to see what? What was proof? So then what did Thomas think the claim was about Jesus? If, if, if he wanted to see the nail holes, then wasn't he looking at the body of Jesus? What else could explain that? And walk them through it. So I, I hope that you can share with a Jehovah's Witness and let their eyes open to the gloriousness of the truth of Christ. Because, and I have a whole video I'm going to link below. Um, I have a video on this exact topic where I go into great detail, quoting Watchtower resources to show what they teach, that the, that Jesus died and is forever dead. The physical Jesus died and is forever dead. That's their teaching. And 
Um, I go through lots of scripture on this topic as well. So I'm going to link that below um, that the Watchtower is wrong about Jesus. It was one of the first live streams I ever did, actually. All right, let's go to the next question. And Mr. Spazzy Jazzy says, uh, how can I honor and love my parents biblically when they take offense and criticize my wife and I for every little thing we do? It's making my wife anxious and we're going to have a baby. We want a relationship with them, but they seem committed to bitterness. Um, okay, there's a there's a ton that can be said on this. Okay, so I, I hope you'll take my answer with a grain of salt, that you'll evaluate how it might apply to your situation. But I do think that um, if you're, if you're, your wife is being mistreated by your family, then part of your job is to pr protect her from that. And scripture has this really striking statement in Genesis when, when, when marriage is basically designed and, and created by God and invented by God. And it says, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. And this very much is, I think, talking about his allegiance. Now, he still is, is loyal to his family, don't get me wrong, but his primary allegiance is to his wife and his kids, not his parents. Now, that's not to say that he's going to honor his parents. Like, you you take care of your family, and, and Paul talks about this. Like, if you're a widow and your own loved ones aren't going to take care of you, like, shame on them. That's a horrible thing. But when a, when conflicts arise, you have a hierarchy of who you, who you are more responsible for and who you are more committed to. An example of this is Jesus. When he says, hate your father and mother, right, or you can't follow me, he doesn't mean actually hate them in the, in the way we usually think in English. This is about choosing him over them. If your parents or your father and mother are coming against your Christian faith, like as 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 happened in my life when I first started walking with Jesus, I had one of my parents who tried to talk me out of it, <laughs> didn't like it very much, and uh, other times where there was difficulty because of it. Um, so that was going on. It's choose your choose choose Jesus over your father and mother every time. So here's what I'm suggesting: your description here, which I don't know the whole story, I don't know the details, um, but your your parents, you say, um, they criticize your wife. For every little thing and and you for every little thing you do and it's making your wife anxious and you're gonna have a baby and, you're, and you're, you're like this feels like a real problem then i think you need to protect her by limiting access now this can be done in a number of ways and i pray god gives you wisdom here don't just copy what i'm saying to you use what i'm suggesting now as ways of making you you're stirring up you thinking creatively and thoughtfully and graciously about how to handle this so one thing that can help in families, and maybe this maybe this bridge has already been burned in your life, I don't know, is to simply go to family members and say, hey, um, I love you, I want relationship with you, but there's something that's happening that um, is going to hurt that, and can I, can I share it with you so that we can overcome it and be closer instead of further apart? By approaching things like that, you're hopefully framing it in a way that they realize that you're not trying to complain, you're trying to fix things, and then you're just very honest with them. Um, I don't know if you're intending this. It's not the issue, but this is the effect it's having. There's a lot of criticism and give examples. You, you said this, you said this, just recently you did this, you said this, you said this. Give specific examples or people, they, they don't see through your eyes, so they won't know. They won't know that the things that they've said have been hurting you. So you have to give specific examples of things like this. It, it just Again, this is my two cents. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, and then let them know, like, I, I, um, I don't want to be subjecting, you know, my myself and my wife to the anxiety that this is causing. And so can, can you please try to respect that and do better so that hopefully you're building a bridge or you're being honest, you're doing this Matthew, you know, uh, chapter 15 thing where you, you're someone sins against you, you go and you tell them and you deal with them and you attempt to reconcile. Um, you do it in a sober moment. You don't do it when you're irritated and angry. If you feel irritated or angry, you, you calm down and you stop talking because you're not trying to feed that. But if, if nothing fixes it, then it's okay to limit to some extent your interactions for the sake of your wife. I think that that seems healthy. The downside of this, the danger of all this advice is that we can become sort of porcupines where, and, and I'm not saying you're like this at all. I'm just, right, my advice is going out to everybody on the internet here. So there's definitely people that are in this situation as they hear this advice. When I say we've become a porcupine, it is, I'm so worried about being wounded and I can't tolerate offense at all, uh, or or so little. I have such a low tolerance for me being offended or being being spoken to in ways that I don't like that I put out the porcupine quills and I become the one who's causing division and causing all kinds of chaos because every little thing triggers me. 
Now, how do I, on, on the other side of the internet, how do I like discern for other people whether you're being a porcupine or if you're just properly protecting and guarding your yourself and your wife? I don't know the answer to this question. I pray that God gives you wisdom so you can figure it out and know that um, love is patient, um, that we're to be slow to speak and slow to anger, um, right? Because th this, these are practices we want to have in place, but you're also called to not be foolish and not just continually put yourself in a situation or your spouse in particular, a situation where they're being mistreated. Um, that's not necessary. So I, I think the higher priority is, is, is the wife over the parents. Although the parents are a very high priority in my life. Not as much as my wife. All right, let's go to number four. Um, Marissa Krejcar says, can someone who is not a Christian show fruits of the spirit? Interesting. Um, they can, it, it, the answer is sort of yes and no. I mean, really the answer is kind of no, but it's sort of yes. So the, let me tell you why it's no. <laughs> um, well, let me tell you why it's yes. I'll start there. The yes part, in my opinion, is um, that they can do things like behave in ways that are that are labeled as fruits of the spirit so when we look at the the fruit of the spirit um what we see is is things like love joy peace patience gentleness faithfulness self-control goodness when we look at those those fruit actually it's actually fruit singular is anyway that's a whole different discussion but the when we look at those things what we see is it's difficult to say that um patience is not something that a, an unbeliever can do. I'm like, no, I, I don't I don't think that's the case. Like unbelievers cannot be patient. They simply cannot be patient. Their patience will never happen with an unbeliever. And that's like, no, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that's weird. I, and, I, and if you feel like you have to say that because patience is a fruit of the spirit and the unbelievers can't have fruit of the spirit, so then uh, therefore they can't be patient. I think that that's incorrect, okay? But what they can't do, so they can't be patient, but what they can't do is be patient as a fruit of the Spirit. You catch that? It's the source. You could be patient, but it's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit within you the way it is with a Christian. It might be part of God working in your life, making you aware of moral realities and things like that. So I'm not saying God isn't involved at all in, the, in, in, in somebody behaving patiently who's not, who's not saved. But I'm saying I don't think it's a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is different than that. And so let me um, uh, let me take you to a verse that kind of supports this. And by the way, we have all of our questions. I got all 20 questions filled up for today. So I'm walking through them now one at a time. And um, and I will be doing next week is, is going to be Q I'm switching my schedule. So next Friday, I'm doing a QA. and a um, And that one will be and then will be every other Friday after that until something else gets in the way. Uh, but that one will be for non-believer questions. So prepare yourself now to ask questions th that, that you don't have to be a non-believer to ask them, although I'm excited to have non-believers asking questions. But questions you get from non-Christians, um, questions you have that feel like that kind of a question, um, that's going to be the focus for next Friday. Non-believer Q&A is the idea here. So um, the fruit of the Spirit here is love, joy, peace. It's the fruit. It's the result. It's the outgrowth of what? The Holy Spirit in your life. Then um, uh, it says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And so we're talking here, the fruit of the spirit is not just a general work of God in human lives. It's rather the work in, of God in the life of the one who lives in the spirit, as in the saved person. So the short answer, unbeliever can have things that are labeled a fruit of the spirit, but they aren't actually the result of living in the spirit. An example of this in your life is simply this. Before you got saved, there were times where you exhibited patience, kindness, gentleness. But you didn't do those things as the way that you did after you got saved, where it was an outgrowth, an outworking of the Holy Spirit in your life. Which is why after you became a Christian, you exhibited more of those things because it's the work of the Spirit in your life. Uh, that's my best understanding of that. Let's go to the next question. Johnny Grenade, 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 either way, man, you sound like action hero. Uh, I'm afraid to talk about issues like abortion slash LGBT, et cetera, for fear that I'll turn people off so much that they won't listen at all when I try to share the gospel. How can I resolve this? Um, read Jesus in the gospels. 
This is this is um yeah. I'll be honest with you. Read Jesus in the Gospels and ask yourself how afraid was he to talk about issues that would make people mad that weren't totally central to the gospel message. When he's in Nazareth, he totally triggers the whole audience. He's there and he, he, he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he, this is in Luke, I think it's chapter two. He, and he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he reads and he says, you know, behold, you know, this is, this is um, fulfilled. Right? I've come to do all this. It's this messianic passage. And he reads it. And he's like, I'm fulfilling it now. And then there's this like riles the people up in a sense. But then he tells them this thing. He's like, hey, you know, you guys are going to turn against me. And just like think about this. And he gives it. Well, let me read it to you. He gives them this Old Testament survey that that is very unpleasant for them to hear. Um, let me find it. Definitely not Luke chapter two. Um, uh, oh wait, that was a mistake. <laughs> I'll find it in a second. He gives him this Old Testament, this Old Testament survey, um, and in it, he um, no, I'm not. I'm like searching for for the passage. You guys probably know it. Uh, It, it, it's Luke 4. Okay. Ah, it's Luke 4, Mike. It's Luke 4, you weirdo. Okay, I'll just read it to you. Um, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he'd opened it, opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. A, a verse that uh, up until that point, he's just reading it and they're like, they're like, oh yeah, we love that verse. We love that passage, you know. And then he closes the book. He doesn't even finish the reading. He closes it. He stops the reading right there, actually right before the phrase, um, and and proclaim the day of the Lord's vengeance, because Jesus here is pausing the vengeance of God. I mean, it was always intended. It's not like it was actually paused. But in a sense, he's he's saying, I'm proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. In his second coming, he's coming with the, with the day of vengeance. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> like that's, he's like, that's fulfilled, which means the I, the spirit of the Lord's upon me. He's anointed me. He, he sent me to do all these things. That's me, Jesus. That's a huge claim. And where did Jesus claim he was the Messiah? Well, there you go. So they all bore witness with him, marveled at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth, which implies that he was doing other teachings as well, too, I think. Um, and said, is this not Joseph's son? They're like, don't we know this guy? He's not that special. Now, Jesus, at this point, how concerned is he about triggering people? He's focused so far kind of on the gospel, the identity of, of, of who he is. But look at what he does next. You will surely say to this, this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we've heard you do in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then, which feels like mocking to them. Then he said, surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows... Oh, this is where it gets offensive. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens, when heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout the, all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now we miss this because we're, we're Gentiles. He's like, there were a bunch of Jewish widows. But who did Elijah go help? A Gentile widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, right? Not the ones in Israel, except the one was, that was cleansed, Naaman the Syrian. None of, Elisha didn't cleanse any of the lepers in Israel. He cleanses a Gentile leper. This is foreshadowing that the gospel will be embraced by the Gentiles, but not wholesale embraced by the Jews. Initially, there's a time coming when it, when I believe that will happen. So, this is super offensive to them. Like, is it central to Jesus's gospel message that he say, "Hey, Gentiles will get will be receiving things that you won't," and, and totally offending the national pride of the Jewish people? Is this is this essential? Not not not. I mean, not in a sense, it's not. 
He could have just been like, hey, I just want to tell you who I am and how much I love you and how much I'm here for you. So they respond. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Modern commentaries, if this wasn't Jesus, if it was anybody else who did something like this, they would look and they would go, well, you really blew that evangelism opportunity, didn't you? The, the anger of the crowd proves that you evangelized wrong. Jesus doesn't, doesn't seem to think so. Paul doesn't seem to think so. They, the, the Gospels the book of, and the book of Acts demonstrate just confronting the, the issues that are in front of us that are related to the gospel, but even aren't the gospel directly itself. What I'm suggesting here is this. Abortion, LGBT stuff, these really matter, and they are in some sense, they're not the gospel, but they're connected because they're barriers that do keep people from embracing Christ. And to simply ignore them, it can be wisdom in some situations, but to have it as a blanket rule, I just ignore all those issues, is not really biblical, right? When the gospels, when, in the gospels, when they go out, he just preaches them to repent. John the Baptist is like, he's the one preparing them for the Messiah. And how does he prepare them for the Messiah? He tells the, the centurion who comes to him, don't be a bully. Don't abuse your authority. He tells the tax collector who comes to him, don't take more than what you're supposed to. These are the issues they're facing. These are like deeply personal issues. I think that Paul would tell a lesbian person, you must repent of your sexual immorality. I, he would absolutely say that. And then if, but Mike, don't say that. That would trigger them. Then they'll, they'll hate you. They'll think you hate them and then they'll leave and they won't listen to the gospel. And I'm like, but if they won't repent, they won't receive the gospel anyways. And that's the attitude that the gospels and the book of Acts have throughout, I think. It's okay to say, this is not an issue I need to tackle right now. And there's times for that. But to make a, here's, here's all I'm opposed to, making a blanket rule. I can, I can never say abortion or LGBT, even though a significant number of my audience are involved in those things. And those things are barriers to them accepting Christ. And those things they, they will actually be judged for on judgment day. But I won't talk about them because I don't want to trigger them. It ends up creating a, sometimes a false Christian who thinks they follow Jesus and believe in Jesus, but they've never understood what they're called to leave behind. And so they've never left it behind. And so they, they're a Christian in name only. And that, that's the big danger that we produce with that. So when you say this, let me read your question again. I'm afraid to talk about issues like abortion, LGBT, et cetera, for fear that I'll turn people off so much they won't listen at all when I try to show the gospel. How can I resolve this? I think you have to get rid of the fear and you have to be okay with them not listening. You have to be okay with them not listening. Jesus was totally okay with that. And sometimes them rejecting you now results in them receiving the gospel later. And you planting that seed and getting them angry and having them storm off that was part of the process of bringing them to Christ. So I'm not one of those people who evaluates evangelism by looking at how happy the person is who you're evangelizing. Do they smile the whole time? Then it was successful. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's bad. Hey, I like it when that happens, but that's not the way to evaluate it. May the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. When you see that abortion or LGBT is an obstacle for this person in their, in their walk with God or their... Uh, hopefully their future walk with God, it's a, it's an issue worth addressing. When, But not that there's, again, this isn't my blanket rule, you always talk about it. It's just you can't have a blanket rule and never talk about it. God give you wisdom and insight, but don't be afraid of people's anger. Don't. That's all on them. And don't take responsibility for it. It's all on them. Number six, uh, Tunable Gene 6 says, how, as 21st century Christians, should we understand the decree for Gentile believers to abstain from blood? So, um, I do have a video on this I'm going to tell you guys about, and I go, go over it in more detail. But let's look at the, you mentioned three verses. Let's look at those real quick. Uh, but that we, okay, so this is the, this is the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Um, actually, this will help us understand it. Yeah, so let, let's just back up a little bit and say this. Um, there were people who were going out and saying, we're from Jerusalem, we represent the apostles, and we're telling all the Gentiles they have to obey the law of Moses, get circumcised, and basically become Jewish if they're going to also be a follower of Jesus. And then there's a council in Jerusalem. And the reason why this is complicated is because the Jews in Jerusalem at the time were still following the Jewish laws for the most part, right? There, maybe some were Hellenistics, and they weren't the same exactly, 
But like, generally speaking, the Jews who came to Jesus continued to do all the Jewish things and were believers in Jesus. And there was nothing wrong with that in the book of Acts. But when Gentiles got saved, they were like, well, we're not going to stop Jews from doing these things, but do we tell Gentiles to do them? Um, and I, I establish all this in the video. I'll link below and maybe the chat, uh, Ahmad can put it in the chat. The video is basically, um, I, I don't remember the title, but it's when I did my little videos on the Hebrew Roots Movement and I dealt with the Book of Acts in particular, a whole video surveying the Book of Acts and the Jewish Gentile law obedience question in the Book of Acts. I don't remember the title, but I'll find it. And I'll link it in the description below after the stream as well. Um, so the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, this issue. Gentiles and the law. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose us that by the mouth of the Gentiles, uh, that by my mouth, that's Peter, um, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe that that was his situation with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. In other words, God gave the Holy Spirit to this Gentile without him becoming a Jew. All he did was believe, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 10. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Right? Not, the, not law, but grace. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Par Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles, kind of showing, look, God's doing an amazing thing among the Gentiles. They should be excited. And after they become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, interesting here that James kind of seems like he steps in with the final solution and maybe even the decision. It, it's interesting how it works. Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Um, that's a powerful phrase. Okay. Uh, after this, I'll return and I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. The Old Testament is actually filled with uh, predictions of Gentiles coming to believe and trust and follow the God of the Jews because he's the God of all creation, right? Genesis 1. He makes it all. He's the God of all. He's not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of all. Chooses the Jews for reasons to do certain things in people, but he's the God of all. So known to God from eternity are all his works. I love that verse. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those who from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, not trouble them. So the, the, the trouble and the yoke, these are negative terminologies for referring to dumping the legal requirements of the law of Moses on them. But that we write to them, to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sunday. So why do they have to do these things? Do they have to, are these lists, is this list a, a full list of things you have to do in order to be saved? Is that what they're doing? No, this seems to be just a list of things that are good to do based upon the Jewish Gentile question. We have Jews and Gentiles in the church we're not going to require the Gentiles to follow the law of Moses in its entirety, but we do request that they do these things for good thing, just because it's good. Abstain from things polluted by idols, right? That, that is, if this food's been offered to idols, if it's associated with idols, it's best if you just don't mess with it. Now, Paul has like kind of like a, a grain of salt or some nuance with this in other passages where he says, look, when you go to the marketplace and you're buying meat, don't ask if it's been polluted, like just eat, just take it and eat. But if you know it's been polluted by idols, if you know someone offered this to an idol before they fed it to you, and they're like, here's some meat. I offered it to the idol of booger face, and you're eating it now, which means you're participating in my booger face worship. Like if, if, if you're confronted with this scenario, don't touch it. Don't dabble. Don't mess with it. So he offers this sort of grain of salt, right? Um, the, the bottom line is they all agree you're not participating in any kind of idolatry. Uh, from sexual immorality, now that's something that's absolutely big time required like as a general rule and it's important in our society today that one of the number one things christians need to know is to abstain from sexual immorality from things strangled and from blood again this has to do with um uh this has to do with possibly with some like uh 
strangled things like the idolatrous practices of, of, of killing animals. Maybe there's a connection there. But there's more of a connection here of just the law. And this is where, where your question comes from, where you're like, hey, what's, what's up with this? Are, you know, why are they having to abstain from things strangled and from blood? I think because there's an intersection of Jewish and Gentile people together. And so they can fellowship together. But how is it going to work if the Gentile is having dunaguan? Okay, that's a Filipino dish, which which I, I've, I've family there's Filipino, so that's a Filipino dish that is cooked with blood, large amounts of blood. You know, that's part of it. And if you're like eating this in front of like your your Jewish neighbor, and, hey, how you doing? It's gonna it's gonna mess up the fellowship. It's just a build fellowship by by not stepping over certain boundaries. Um, that are considered the most extreme. Okay, maybe you're not kosher, but at least you don't eat things that are strangled and you're just not eating blood. Um, then Moses is the reason, the justification for this. Why? is because Moses has, in many generations, been preached in the synagogues in every Sabbath, in every city, so that there is such an awareness of the law. We're not requiring you to be obe- obedient to the law, we're, but we're asking you to acquiesce to these things, at least for the health of the relationships that you have with others. This is sort of reinforced in the letter they write to the congregations. They send this letter out from Jerusalem and it says, you know, that you abstain. Oh, we, we don't want to lay a burden on you. Okay, you don't have to go become Jewish, but you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you do, if you keep yourselves from these, you do well. You do well, not you will go to heaven. You, you won't go to heaven if you don't. You do well. It, it's a it's a good idea is, is the presentation. Um... Not to say that you, it's just a good idea to abstain from sexual immorality, but minimally, all of these are just a good idea. Some of them are, are more than just a good idea. So yeah, now as a, as a Christian today, you're like, do I have to do this now? Like here's a letter to the Gentile churches in general. Hey, maybe, maybe you don't just drink blood. Maybe you don't just have like dunaguan. Maybe that's something you don't eat. Um, and maybe, maybe you should apply it today. I, I am far from me to hold you back from that. If that's your conviction. I lean on the side of this is a fellowship uh, thing. And Paul, and there's there's some evidence for this as well in, say, 1 Corinthians. Paul talks about food, and, and in Romans 2, and he's like, hey, if, in Romans 14, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'm not going to touch it. And the stumbling that goes on between the, the Jew and the Gentile people, and, and then this Moses has been taught throughout all the, all the synagogues, over the issue of blood in particular would have would have potentially caused a lot of problems in the church. And so it was an act of increasing fellowship. It is not a requirement for your sanctification. It's something to do out of love and fellowship for others. So that I would say, if you are interacting like they are in a community where you have Jews and Gentiles or those who who have strong convictions about especially you know strangled things in blood, then you take on that as well so that you can fellowship with them and have that sweetness of connection. I think that would be my application um, based upon 1 Corinthians and Romans and how this food issue is often decided on what you will and won't eat or won't do, decided on who you're fellowshipping with at the time. That's part of the, the measure. Yeah. Okay, let's go to question seven. Brandon Driver says, do the righteous live by faith or is no one righteous? How do we reconcile these ideas without compromising their original meaning? Um, so there's a lot to say about this. Um, but um, but the term the term righteous is used in, I think the key is this, the term righteous in the Bible is used in a number of different ways. The same word used in a number of different ways. And so we have scripture that affirms that people are righteous. And we have scripture that says no one is righteous. And how do you figure out what it what it means? It's not it does not say it's contradicting. I think context is king. And so in Romans, when Paul's like giving this blanket statement, no one is righteous, no, not one. In Romans one through three, he's building this long case for the idea that no one can be can stand before God and be saved based upon their own goodness. So no one is righteous in the sense of meeting God's standards for holiness such that they can, you know, enter heaven, can enter eternal life, can be justified by themselves. So then Romans 4, he goes on to like, no, you, you know, you'll be justified how Abraham was by faith. 
That, that's how you'll be saved, righteous by faith. Um, but then the Bible calls like Joseph of Arimathea a righteous man. What? Because in, in context, it means, and we do this in our, we do this all the time in our culture. Let me use the word good as a parallel. Um, no one is good, Christians will say. And then they'll, they'll say, oh, I love that guy. He, he's such a good man. <laughs> and then another Christian goes, you can't, well, wait a minute. You say no one's good. Then you're like, but that guy's good. Or I've been confronted. Have you had this happen by someone totally well-meaning, sincere believer, but confronted because on Sunday morning I'm walking to church and he goes, how you doing, Mike? And I go, I'm doing good. And he goes, you know what he says, right? You, you can predict it. No one is good, but God, Mike, no one is good, but God. And if you've had that happen to you, you immediately think, don't you know that that's not what I meant? <laughs> And I think that's what we have to do as scripture is go, um, when I say he's a good man, I mean, by comparison to other men, he is good. That's a fair comparison to make by comparison to other people in general. He keeps his word more. He works hard. He has, um, integrity, knowledge, and, and kindness, you know, more than on average, these other people are. So he's a good man, but I in no way mean he's good. Like God, no one's good. Like God in that sense. No one is righteous. So Joseph Arimathea is a righteous man, meaning he's upstanding amongst men, but not that he's righteous the way God is. When we say God is holy, God is righteous. He's not like that. So that when it comes to how do I evaluate this person compared to other people? Oh, he's a righteous man. He's a good man. How do I um, get, how does he get saved? Oh, he's not righteous at all by comparison to God. He falls so short of God's glory. So the rich, the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus is a good example of this. He seems like a good guy. And he's like, Jesus, and it's in, it's in Luke, you know, chapter 18, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I'm so, this is, just so you guys know, numbers, I'm terrible with numbers. Remembering the numbers associated with chapters and verses, that'll make some of you feel better to know that, that you're not alone. I can sometimes quote passages. I can't remember the exact location. I don't, it just doesn't stick. At any rate, um, the, uh, the, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he seems like a really good guy, you know, at least by human standards. But Jesus, when he goes, hey, you know, Jesus, what must I do? Teacher, tell me, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven, to, to, to get salvation? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Jesus confronts him with this idea of he was not making the distinction. He was thinking, you're good, I'm good, let's be good, and then we'll be good before God. He didn't realize there's this, this unbridgeable chasm between human goodness and the goodness of God. So then Jesus confronts him and he says, oh yeah, obey the commandments. And he goes, oh, I do all that since I was a youth. But the guy doesn't really know. He has issues with other things he's not even aware of. He thinks he's good like God is good, but he's just good like people are good, which is a pretty low standard in, in reality. So Jesus says, go and sell all you have and come follow me. And it shows that this man, he's not good like he thought. Jesus, he gave up everything to serve us. He, this man doesn't want to give up his riches and follow Jesus because he's very wealthy. So he goes away sad. He had um, sin grabbing in his heart that he had no clue about. So he thought he was good and he wasn't. So yeah, I think the Bible uses these terms in the same way that we do often in our culture today. It's okay to say that's a good person. And just as long as people know, you, I don't mean compared to God. He's a loser compared to God. <laughs> he's a total sinner with all kinds of moral compromise and issues that are not even seen by those of us who are like, he's good. I just mean like, I feel like I could trust him with my car keys. <laughs> you know, That's all we mean. All right, let's go to uh, question eight. Um, I have a Muslim friend that I speak with regularly about God. I'm a firm Christian, but I question how other God-fearing people who have been indoctrinated into a specific religion are not saved. Um, let's look at Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God. Does that sound like your friend? Right now, there's some who say the word Allah is, is it, Allah is a different God. The word Allah is just the Arabic word for God. And so when, when you speak Arabic, if you're a Christian, what do you call God? You call God Allah, but you do define God differently. So the, the, the Muslim version of God is different than the biblical version of God, like in some significant ways. Um, Allah does not, you know, the Muslim version, I should say, does not love the sinners um, and the wicked the way that the way that the tr true God does. Um, and he measures things based on merit, but even that you're not sure, you know, you'll get to heaven. Um, 
Muhammad said that he had a, in, in, I think it's one of the hadith that says Muhammad had a vision of hell and it was filled. Was it Muhammad or it's in one of the hadith? I don't know if it was exactly from Muhammad, but it's one of the hadith that says there was a vision of hell and, and in it, it was mostly filled with women. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was, it was just, it's just evidence that this is a human sourced religion, right? Like he is, he just, he just has bias against women in general. He sees them mostly as sex objects, obviously from all sorts of other stuff we know about Muhammad. Um, at any rate, uh, your buddy has a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. Does that matter? Yeah. That, that, that's the thing keeping the Israelites that, that, that Paul cares about from being saved. These Jews who, they know who the God of the Old Testament is, right? But but they don't know some important things about God. Their, their zeal is there. They're fully zealous. They're willing to like do crazy things on behalf of this belief they have, this zeal they have for God. But it's not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. We just talked about how righteous God is compared to us. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. And they what? They seek to establish their own righteousness. That's what Muslims do too. They're going to try to be good enough to earn eternal life. But because of that, they've not submitted to, God, to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for, the, for righteousness to everyone who believes. The bottom line is that my sin, this is an important rule in life. Your sincerity will not save you. A sincere and zealous Muslim is not thereby a good person in the eyes of God. A sincere and zealous Jew is not thereby a good person. Now, it feels good because sincerity and zeal are good things in and of themselves. But if they are misdirected, then they are good things that are skewed and they can be harmful. And it's combined with a deception, a self-deception about your own goodness, ultimately a self-righteousness about your about yourself. We live in the, the deeply disturbing reality where where people are, are not saved. And you get to know them and you care about them. And God cares about them. And it might be tempting to think, well, but they're sincere. I mean, they won't listen to me about Jesus. And they don't respond to the gospel. And every time I try to share it with them, it's, it's rejection for different reasons. You know, and I, and I try to preach to them and show them that, that Jesus is the righteous one. He died on the cross, he rose again. And they reject all that over and over again. But they seem so sincere. Like, look at, look at, um, the, the, I saw a video, you guys may have seen this on Twitter, right? There was a video of, of, in, was it, is it, what state was this in? Anyway, one of the states starts with the N, I think, um, uh, there was an abortion bill passed to protect abortion rights. And there was this video of women gathered together, celebrating this victory of their ability to kill their own children with doctor help. Tears in their eyes. Tears coming down their faces because they're so deeply just relieved that they have this liberty, this deep personal right. A woman's right has been preserved. Women's rights. Oh, it's a liberation moment. Oh, it's we're being delivered from the oppression of, of men or oppression of the system and all this other stuff. And we're being free to live our lives. These are the things they believe. Are they sincere? Totally. These tears are not fake. Because sincerity doesn't matter if it's misdirected, you're just sincerely wrong. There's there's deception involved. And so I, I, I get what you're asking here. What I'm suggesting is this. You can't give people a pass on needing Jesus because they're sincere. Paul couldn't either, even though he wished he could. It's not how reality works. And it's not how God works. And ultimately, we'll find that humans, when, we're, when we believe certain things that are lies, there are sometimes other causes for us to believe those lies that, are, that come from within. I'm actually rebelling against God's righteousness. I'm establishing my own righteousness. And so all my sincerity and zeal on the outside looking really good is actually partly just driven by self-righteousness that is not very pretty. And um, yeah, that's my honest answer. I, I, I hope you find it helpful, buddy. Let's go to question number nine. Um, Kaylee Witten says, um, could the Holy Spirit be feminine? A biblically sound, wiser, older Christian in my life is unsure about this. He brings up decent arguments affirming this view. But then there's John 15, 26. Thoughts? Um, I started some notes. I was I wanted to do a video on this one of these days. And I started some notes a long time ago on the topic, trying to look at all the different debates. Um, 
And um, I'll look at the passage that you're mentioning here in just a second. And I, I never finished the notes. I, I, it's just one of those many, many projects that I like started and didn't finish. So Kaylee, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll do something more detailed, more detailed on it. Let's look at John 15, 26, and I can see what you're thinking of here. Um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to like feminine and masculine terms, re refer to the Holy Spirit, it is complicated because the word spirit, the Holy Spirit is, is not a masculine term, if I recall correctly. I'm going to look at this up. So spirit, pneuma, um, is a is a neuter turn here at least, but we have to understand something too. Is that name um, in English? We usually assign gender to a term on occasion because gender is important. But in other languages like Spanish, Greek, gender is assigned all over the place, and it's not always indicating the gender of a person. But when it is indicating the gender of a person, is when you refer to them as he will do this or she will do that. And here's one example that you bring up that's very good, where the Holy Spirit is explicitly referred to with, with, a, with a male gender. So, he will bear witness of me, this, this word, um, or he will testify of me. That's one word in the Greek, he will testify, uh, ekenos, and it is masculine, right? It's a masculine term. That matters if the Holy Spirit was intended to be feminine. If we were supposed to think of the Holy Spirit as feminine, you would not have a masculine term. It's not like, and then Deborah was a judge of the land and he did a good job. <laughs> you, know, you don't, you don't see that happen. Now, there's a lot more to be said about this. And maybe one day I'll do like a, a longer video on the topic. Um, the Holy Spirit, th there's some people who will, who will try to appeal to like these sort of motherly metaphors for the Holy Spirit. Or God using motherly metaphors. Paul even does this of himself. He's like, um, you know, I, I, uh, he has like a like a motherly affection. I think is the term. I'm trying to remember the verse now. It escapes my mind. Um, Jesus talks about gathering Jerusalem as a mother hen gathers her chicks, and so people will try to be like, this is divine feminine language, and I think this is a really garbage argument here. Um, yes, God is speaking of motherly love. This is not to suggest that God should be thought of as a mother. This is, this is, there's a difference between these things, right? Um, clearly God in, indicates he's a father and consistently. So if there's a motherly terminology referred to Jesus, who's clearly male and intentionally male for lots of reasons, then we should, we should grant that and know that just a metaphor or a feminine like analogy does not make somebody female. That's just part of our culture's obsession with reversing gender stuff. That we're currently going through and so we, we we tend to get weird about that um so yeah there's short answer kaylee i know there's a lot more that can be said about this i'd be interested to hear the other arguments that this person has um i think that they they the people i've met who've talked about this they don't usually mean to disrupt something they're not trying to cause trouble it's more often they think that they're being progressive in the positive sense of like being inclusive in the positive sense <laughs> of like oh i just want people to see the fullness of God and his love. And I think women should be able to identify with God too and all this. And I want those things too. But I don't want to unintentionally stumble forward into this gender bending attitude that we have in our culture. And so the Holy Spirit is more, it doesn't fit a, a, a feminine label. I, I think that that's inappropriate. Um, even though there's other ways you can see there's, Feminine terminology sometimes used or metaphors sometimes used, but that doesn't make someone feminine. All right. This is a question from Yedis Redis Deletus. <laughs> Favorite YouTube name from today. What are your thoughts on Matthew 11.25? I've been raised in the Branham cult where there's a great deal of anti-intellectualism and they also claim God has blinded most Christians from Branham. Um... You know, um, I have a video on the whole serpent, like theology stuff that, that William Branham taught. I have a video on there. You might want to look it up and I'll link that one below too after this thing, just in case it might help you. But let's look at Matthew eleven twenty five. 
At the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. So you're like, hey, you know, this 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 uh, this cult is kind of, you know, it's anti-intellectual. Um, and they use this verse to support that anti-intellectualism. And anti-intellectualism here does not mean you you disagree with scholars on things, okay? Scholars disagree with scholars on things. It's rare that the scholars unanimously agree on anything. Um, and it's okay to not agree. But what what is not good is to actually dismiss the, the idea of scholarly work uh, or the idea of going deep and studying carefully and using your full mind to love God with all your mind. Like that would be a bad thing. And sometimes what you have in a cult group is you have bad explanations for lots of verses. And when people push back and they go, well, the context doesn't mean that. Or in the Greek, it actually doesn't say what you're suggesting. Um, hey, I was reading and no commentator in the entire history of planet Earth has ever thought what you think about this. And they go, ah, you're, you have this spirit of intellectualism and pride. <laughs> and it's a way of defending so that they can bolster bad teaching with a, a barrier, a guard against being rebuked by people who know better because they'll call it intellectualism. So how does this verse apply? Well, Jesus clearly thought that the people who were wise were stupid and the people who were, were foolish were, were wise. <laughs> it's like, well, no, that's, that's maybe that's what they think it means. Um, let's just take this verse in its actual context. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and reveal them to babes. Okay, babes is a metaphor here. Babes here is a metaphor for those who are not part of that, like, um, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, ultimately. Now, some Pharisees and Sadducees did get saved, but they did not, as a, as a whole, embrace Christ. And they should have. They should have been the ones who knew better. Okay, so there are times where you look at the intellectual elite and you go, Y'all are off on this stuff, right? Like you should be able to see it. But you could reason also why they're wrong. Like you're not just, you're not, you're saying, I think the intellectual elite are wrong, but I'm not rejecting the process of thinking things through. That's an important distinction. Um, and, and this is what's happening. Yeah, they're being wise. Now, can you transfer this onto whatever group you want? It definitely applied to Jesus and applied to the people who were rejecting Jesus at the time. And the people who received him being the, the, the babes or those who were viewed as simple and they received and embraced Christ. Although there were others, Nicodemus did. Um, there were synagogue rulers who embraced Christ. There were others. So can you take this though? And, and this is what cults do a lot. They'll just willy-nilly transfer something that's directly about Jesus and, and apply it to themselves. Like this is them rejecting the teaching of Jesus directly. And the Branham cult will be like, yes, well, and whoever rejects William Branham's teachings, they're the same. Well, what keeps the Jehovah's Witness from doing that? Like I could imagine an argument between someone who's part of the Branham group and a Jehovah's Witness. And the Jehovah's Witness says, well, of course you reject our beliefs and you think that you're smarter than all that. But you're, you know, these things have been hidden from the wise and revealed to us babes. We have the right faith. And the Branham cult goes, of course you think that that's the case and you think that you've got the revelation of the truth. You know, these things are hidden from you and they're revealed to the babes. And then the Mormon can come alongside and be like, of course you both think that you're this and and we're actually the ones who it's been revealed to and you guys are like the wise and the prudent and we're the babes who it's been revealed to. And this is the problem of just uh, making anything you want about you when it was never about you. Jesus is the standard. What I should do is I should compare all three of these groups to the scriptures because that's where Jesus is revealed. And that does take some mental work. I read what Jesus says. I read what the apostles say. And I go, if you're rejecting Jesus, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness teaching, right, or Branham teaching, if you're rejecting the teachings I get in the New Testament from Jesus and his apostles, then you can't apply this verse to you. You need to first prove to me that what you're saying is scriptural. Then you could maybe back up and say, well, maybe the wise and prudent are simply rejecting the gospel as they did once before. But you can only say that if you have first prove that you're affirming exactly what scripture is already affirming. So it's the, it's the willingly transfer, the, the baseless and evidenceless transfer of scriptures from applying to Jesus and his teachings to applying to William Branham and his teachings. Um, lots of cults do this. Something to watch out for. Let's go to number 11. 
truth says in the Bible, it says, ask and you shall receive. I asked Jesus to save my mother, but he didn't. Why did he then say, ask and you shall receive? Um, so I, I think it, first off, I'm, I'm assuming what you mean by this is that your mother was not a believer and that you prayed for her to be saved, to turn her, put her trust in Christ. And she never did. And, and it really broke, broke your heart. That's a heartbreaking thing. It breaks God's heart too. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Um, but I think that you've, 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 you've had a clumsy reading of this idea when Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Let me, let me just say this. It's, I have, I have a whole teaching on this. I'm going to link, I'm going to link below and I hope you'll watch the whole teaching because I, I feel like a lot needs to be said about it. And this is just a quick Q and A. So I'm going to share a couple things real quick, but, um, I'll link below a teaching where I get into this issue and it's an, it's about name it and claim it. The idea that I could just ask anything I want and I'm going to get it. And I, I think it's been a, 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 a it's a study. I, I spent weeks preparing for that teaching and I shared it and I think it was very important and, and impactful for a lot of people. And the comments tell me the feedback says they were really helped a lot. So I think this would really help. I'm going to link that below, not because oh, I did such a good job. I'm just letting you know, um, I was very careful and thoughtful in how I did it. And I think it's very biblical. And when you get the full teaching of scripture on this topic, it will help your heart. So I'm going to link that video for you below. It, it has to do with, um, it's like how correct is Kenneth Copeland on the best name it and claim it verse. Um, I, but it's a very serious study. It's just, you know, okay. So when you look at this idea of, um, asking you shall receive, when Jesus is coming to the disciples at, at, and there's a turn, a change in the relationship, the way that the Jews are going to relate to God, instead of praying through like the temple, I'm going to access God, try to access God through the temple and through in, including sacrifices. Instead, now I'm just going to ask, ask God directly through Jesus. That's a big change. And so part of his teachings on prayer is just to teach them that they're now going directly to God through Jesus. And he's the mediator and he's the fulfillment of all those things that the temple represents. So they have direct access to God through Jesus. That's actually a really big deal. If you don't see that, you'll think that there's statements about prayer in general that are actually meant to be statements about the change, the transition to prayer being through Jesus as opposed to some other source. Um, asking you shall receive is a general idea. He's like saying the doors are open. God is receptive to your prayers. It's not a promise that every single time you ask, you'll get whatever you ask. Imagine how scary the world would be if that was the case. Just think for a second. How scary the world would be if everybody could ask what they wanted and get what they wanted with no controls. That would be a very scary world. You, you, you'd mess up your own life even. Man, that girl's, that girl's really pretty. Lord, I want her to be my wife. And poof, you're married. Then, oops, you're like, oh, that was a mistake. Lord, I pray that we're not married anymore. <laughs> like, I, What controls this? And what controls this is ultimately the will of God. Um, so when we get to James chapter three, we get, we get, I'll just give you the one verse on this. Um, oh, let me get it. James chapter four, sorry. So James chapter four, he says, um, he talks about trouble they're having in the church, trouble, you know, arguing and, and fighting and, and all this stuff. And he says, you have, you don't have because you don't ask the things you're missing. You're missing because you're not, you're not seeking from God. That's interesting. That's just like what you said. Well, ask it, but I asked and I didn't get, and he gives some reasons why sometimes people ask and don't get, he says, you ask and do not receive, but it's because you ask a miss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Now I'm not saying at all that you were selfishly asking for God to save your mom. That's not what I'm saying at all. You're asking something God wants to, God wants to save her too. But there are at least times, here's what James proves. There's times where when you ask, it ends up being that your motives are wrong, which proves one important reality. Prayer is not a blank check. Your prayer can, God can say no because your prayer is some, something's wrong with your prayer. Another one is simply that it's not according to the will of God. Um, that's in first John. Let me get you there. So this is first John where it says, uh, this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, am I suggesting that it, so obviously our prayers are limited to, well, is it, is it God's will? Now God's will may be 
something within this range of options and you're asking so you're going to get it and if you didn't ask you wouldn't get it but but just, but am i suggesting then that um that that means god just didn't want your mom saved not at all not at all i think the reality is that god wanted your mom to to give her heart to christ and so in your prayers god save my mom save my mom he's probably reaching out to her that much more with the holy spirit impacting her life reaching you know witnessing to her through the work of the holy spirit or sending others and um and yet his will is not that she would violate, that he would violate and turn her to an automaton where she just automatically gets saved. So I think that this comes down to a free will choice that your mom had to make that God didn't violate. And, um, and that God was probably active as you prayed and, and witnessing to her and stuff. And this is a, assuming that I've understood your question, right? But, but yeah, prayer is not a blank check. It's according to God's will. It, we can ask a miss. And God's will is not to to ultimately to violate our ability to say yes or no to the gospel. That is my understanding of, of that. Now, a Calvinist would disagree with that. I don't know how he would answer your question, to be honest. Um, um, it probably wouldn't make you happy. <laughs> but, but no offense. I love my Calvinist brothers and sisters, actually. I, um, I usually enjoy spending more time with Calvinists than anybody else. Because <laughs> we have so much in common, even though we don't have that in common. All right, number 12, Summer Premon says, why does 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen seem to have opposite meanings depending on the translation? How should we understand it? Thank you for your obedience to Christ. It has greatly benefited my family. Well, thank you, Summer. Um, okay, let me look at this and see if I can figure out what the what the question is. Um, um, okay, yeah, I did a six-hour video on this, didn't I? <laughs> okay, um, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. The custom is is in question. What is being by, Paul mean by custom? Is he referring to what he's talked about in this passage? A woman um, uh, failing to cover her hair, her hair? Is that it? Or is he, continu- is he referring to the custom being contentious? He goes, if you're going to make a big fight about this, like we don't do that. Like it's not our custom to be contentious. Um, so there's a debate that's going on. But let's look at this in a couple of translations. So the New King James, I already read, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Okay, here's the ESV. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Yeah, that feels about the same. The NIV says, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Yeah, that feels about the same, actually. Let's see. Here's the NR, the, the RSV. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we recognize no other practice, nor do the churches of God. That feels about the same. I'm looking for a translation that, that like deviates significantly in a way that I'll understand your question better. This is, the, this is I know you can't read this. This is the ASV. Um, if any man seemeth to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. I know you can't see this, guys. I'm going to read it to you. This is the good news translation. If anyone wants to argue about it, all I have to say is that neither we nor the churches of God have any other custom in worship. Yeah, what I'm getting consistently here, I'm, I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm just not picking up on 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 the question properly. I apologize if I'm not. I'm really sorry. Sometimes that happens. It's just my own failing. I apologize. Uh, don't feel bad about the way you worded it. That's just again, it's just humans talking to each other. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that of the big difference. I know in the debate when I the, among scholars, like they're like, what is the thing that people are contentious about? What is the practice? And is and and my conclusion, I think, is you know, it's about women having uh, coverings because that's the main thing over here. Her hair is given to her for a covering, and I have this is again, this is super complicated passage. There's tons of debates in it. I have a six hour long video on this passage going over all the debates and all the issues it's timestamped so you can bounce around maybe you'll find a better answer in that video so we'll link that below as well linking lots of videos today below and you guys if you want to watch that you can um, or bounce around and find it. It, it we deal with that whole passage and how it relates to head coverings as well as um the women in ministry topic and marriage issues and stuff like that so I'm, I'm sorry i think i'm just not quite picking up on it maybe i read those pa- translations and there's right there in front of me and i just didn't see it so I apologize, Summer, if I didn't give you a better answer there. I'm, I'm glad that my other content is useful for you. <laughs> All right, number 13. MC says, I've just learned that some Bibles are missing passages. How should we approach the Bible knowing some verses have been left out? Oh, yeah, you ask such a good question, my friend. 
allow me to introduce to you the contentious world of what translation of the Bible you should trust. <laughs> um, back when I was younger, uh, I used the much younger, like first, first Bible was NIV. I read the Bible, didn't even know about Bible translations I, much. I just knew this one that's readable to me. So I read in the NIV, going to church, it's, you know, reading it, it's falling apart and stuff like that. Um, years later, I, I, I go from the church I was at into, um, a different church, uh, a, uh, a Calvary Chapel who uses New King James. So I went to New King James. Now, not from the pulpit at the church I was at. I was at Calvary Downey. Not from the pulpit, okay? But from amongst some people in the community, there was a great deal of suspicion towards the any Bible other than the King James Version. The NIV was one of the chief ones that people were worried about. And they were like, oh, this one, the NIV, that's the not inspired version, which I'm like, whoa, that's like throwing out a major claim. You're saying this Bible is so badly translated, it's no longer inspired by the Holy Spirit. The contents are not even from the Holy Spirit. I'm like, that's a big claim. And I remember getting very nervous. And one of the talking points they had, MC, was, was what you just asked about. They go, well, look at all these missing verses. Ah, go to Mark such and such. Look it up. And you open your Bible and it's not there. There, It just goes from like this verse to... The, two verses later, and the, the, there's a missing verse. Um, then they can show you other places where it took out the phrase Lord in reference to Jesus. Here it said Lord Jesus Christ, but they just have Jesus. They're trying to take out Jesus being Christ and Jesus being Lord. And this was the stuff I'd heard, not from the pulpit, not from the teaching of the, of the of this, I'm not saying that, just from some of the people that were around me. And, um, and it made me very worried. And so I became suspicious of other translations. So New King James was considered good because they use basically the same text groupings as the King James. And so you have all the same readings and you don't have those missing passages. But this is where it becomes a more complicated debate. I start doing some research. I start trying to understand how I got my Bible, how I got my New Testament, how what the manuscripts actually say. And I realize it's not an issue of taking out a passage. It's a question of whether that passage was ever there originally. That's a different question, isn't it? Imagine, if you will, something that we would, I think we have solid evidence for among scribes, is that scribes would sometimes, when they're copying, say, Matthew or Luke, they would sometimes, it only happens sometimes, but it would happen, where they would go, ah, Luke has this extra phrase, Matthew doesn't. Well, I know it's in Luke, I'll just put it here in Matthew because it corresponds to what, what Matthew is saying and what Luke said. And so you'd have a phrase that occurred in, say, Luke, put into Matthew. How do we know? Because we have other copies of Matthew where that phrase does not exist. So you could open your Bible and you open, say, NIV, NASB, ESV, any of the modern translations other than New King James. And you, you'd see in Mark, oh, that verse isn't there. Or that phrase is gone. But in Matthew, it's there. Or in Luke, it's there. Because they're saying... We think the original manuscript didn't have it there, and a scribe was harmonizing two of the Gospels and added it. Another thing scribes would do, it seems, and I've studied into this more, is they would um, do, there's a term for it. I can't remember the term for it, but it's basically, a, it's about piety. And um, let me give you an example. So, so some of you, you don't like when people say Jesus, you like it when they say Lord Jesus. I, I like that too. And sometimes I think of that uh, as I'm saying Jesus, I say, Lord Jesus. And I think it's just respectful. Lord Jesus. I like that. Well, some scribes thought that too. And so they're recording the word Jesus and they might add Lord. Not to change the Bible, but just to, to give proper respect to Jesus. And so as time goes on, sometimes you have a passage that says Jesus and it says Lord Jesus. Another scribe has Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see because we have so many manuscripts of the Bible, we can trace and try to figure out what the original said. So, is the NIV or these other ones trying to take out titles of Jesus and remove verses, or are they simply getting better and better at understanding and with more and more discoveries and more manuscripts to read, better and better at figuring out what the original was? I think that that's the case, generally speaking. So, there's only really two significant passages in your New Testament that are up for question here, and it's John, the passage in John that speaks of the woman at the well. And it's the last 12 verses in the Gospel of Mark. These are, and then there's uh, the, what's called the, the comma Johannum, I believe, is the, the right term for it, um, in, in 1 John about the Trinity. Um, 
these are like the three big things that draw people's attention and just about everything else is really stuff you're like that doesn't seem very significant like okay so matthew doesn't say it but luke does so we're not even asking whether the bible says it or not we're just asking if it says it in two places or one like okay i'm like not worried about that um so those passages like the common johannem it seems uh that that does not belong in first john it doesn't threaten the doctrine of the trinity one bit okay i have a whole video on the trinity i don't re rely on that verse to defend it completely um also the um the passage of the woman at the well that seems like it was added later that really does and it seems like there's really good evidence to see that it was added later and that's probably the passage that would bother people the most i don't think it should it will probably bother your heart okay but but the more time you spend thinking about this i think the less it will I'm going to link below my videos about how we got our Bible, why we should trust it, where I talk about even those passages. I'll link three videos about all that stuff, how we got the manuscripts, Bible translations. I'll link it all below, and you can check that out for more detail. It shouldn't bother your heart, even though at first it'll feel like a shock to you. Um, but, but, but yes, the Bible is preserved and reliable. You don't have any doctrines in question. The even that one passage, uh, it the, the 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 theory that seems the most appealing to me is that. Um, about the woman at the well is that it is a story about Jesus known from the time of Christ, right? But that in the manuscript tradition, it's looking for a place. Like sometimes it's in John, sometimes it's the end of John, sometimes it's in some other place altogether because it's a story people knew and they wanted to preserve it. So they preserved it alongside different texts of scripture and eventually um, uh, due to a long explanation of, of, of reasons, <laughs> it ends up in the King James Version and then people think, well, the King James has the most verses, so it must be the most preserved and the best and all this. And I get into all that debate in those videos. I'll link below. Um, don't let it freak you out. Calm down. Take a breath. Your Bible's very reliable. Totally reliable. Question is, okay, so maybe I'll summarize it this way. All of the Bible is definitely there. The question is whether or not some extra stuff is there. But all the extra stuff is like it's saying Lord Jesus Christ, where it would have just said Lord Jesus. Or it having this, the, the biggest one, probably just that story of Jesus and the wind at the well. Is that meant to be there initially? Um, or is it maybe there just by God's divine providence? You can make a case for that. Anyway, I'll just link the video below. Sorry for opening a can of worms. But uh, I think the bottom line is, it's not that the passages are missing in some Bibles. It's that they are, there's extra content in some. It doesn't change our theology though. 14, MLDCO says, my 10-year-old wants to know if Satan was defeated. Why is there still evil on the planet? I couldn't think of a good way to answer her help. All right, so um, think of it this way. Imagine if your kid's on a playground and they're playing a game and the game has like monsters and 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 then there's kids that are like, enslaved to the monsters and the monsters are control. I mean, so this is for your kid. Okay. This is an analogy for your daughter and you're, the monsters are controlling your kid. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I said the woman at the well. Oh, Sarah, thank you so much. She just pause that whole question. I said the woman at the well, I meant the woman caught in adultery in, in, in John eight. I, that's what I was talking about. The woman caught in adultery, not the woman at the well. Forgive me, you guys. I'm so sorry. I just bred a ton of confusion. I, <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> It's about, it's the passage of the woman caught in adultery, um, and the writing in the ground and all that. I, I just, I just misspoke at any rate. So here's the analogy. You're at a playground and your kids, you're, they're, you're playing a bunch of games and some of the kids, they're monsters and other ones, they're just kids who need to be saved, right? They're, they're enslaved to the monsters. These kids did bad things and the bad things made them enslaved to the monsters. And so now they have to do what all the monsters say. And there's like a chief monster and the chief monster He's the one who runs all the monsters and he kind of controls all the people that are enslaved, all these other kids, and he's controlling them and making their lives miserable. And it was all because of the bad decisions these kids made. You know, they cheated and lied and stole and stuff. But now they're all enslaved to this monster. And then, you know, this one hero shows up and it, and, and, and it's, he's not really a kid, but he shows up and he looks like a kid and he takes on the form of a kid and he's never done anything wrong. He doesn't believe belong there. He shouldn't be punished for anything these other kids have done, but he decides to take all the punishment for all the bad things those other kids did, right? This, this represents Jesus. And this kid goes and he just lives perfectly and he demonstrates to these other kids this better way to live, this holy way to live. And then the big baddie monster, who's like Satan, he kills this kid. And that kid dies. But what the bad monster didn't know is that the kid died as a way of getting victory 
for all the kids who've been enslaved. And after he dies, forgive this weird little analogy, inside the playground, there's a, there's there's like this bubble that comes out, this like glowing light that comes out from where he died. And he comes back up and he's alive again and he's standing there. And if you'll come and stand in the bubble, then then the monster can't get you. The monster can't, he, and he's not, he doesn't enslave you anymore. As long as you stand in the bubble, then the victory that this kid has becomes your victory too. So all the kids that get in the bubble, they're safe and they're saved from the attacks and the control and the slavery of the monsters in the playground. So why is there still bad things happening in the playground? Because not everybody's inside. Because that hasn't happened yet. Because there's a time coming when this kid who rose from the dead, who represents Jesus taking on our form and dying for us and rising, there's a time coming when he's going to go and he's going to destroy that bad monster and he's going to take over the whole playground. But he's waiting and waiting because he wants more kids to voluntarily just come and be part of the bubble, you know, <laughs> and put their faith in Jesus. So the bottom line is this. Jesus defeated Satan so that whoever believes in Jesus, they will be protected from, from the control of, of Satan in their life. But they're still in a, a fallen world. And Jesus is waiting and waiting for more people to get saved. He doesn't want bad things to happen in this world, but he wants more people to come to Jesus. And so if he came right now and he put an end to all the evil of the world, then your friends might not get saved. Your, your family who doesn't know Jesus, they would never get saved because they don't have any more time. So while he's waiting and adding more time for people to get saved, more bad stuff goes on in the world, but more people are getting saved every day. There's a time coming where all the bad stuff will end. And that's just seems to be how God has planned it out. So put, put your trust in Christ, rest in him and know that even when bad stuff happens to you now, because God's waiting for more people to get saved, you're not under the control of Satan. You're not, you're not a slave to sin anymore. So you're saved from that and you'll be saved from everything else too in a future time. Let's go to question 16, 15, 15. Anne Murray, please explain what hyper charismatic means. Thank you. Well, and these sort of terms are very tricky. And, and I found that like, I'll use the term myself and I know what I mean by it, but I'll go to another community and they mean something different by it. Like I've called myself charismatic and I know some charismatics that say that I'm not even charismatic. Well, he's not really charismatic, you know, he's, or he's charismatic, but not Pentecostal or Pentecostal, but not charismatic. And, and I realized that I'm not, we're not all using these terms the same way. So usually in, in very broad strokes, what hyper charismatic means is like, Hey, you're charismatic, meaning you believe in the active gifts of the spirit, that the gifts of the spirit, like if someone goes, oh, that person spoke in tongues, you're not like, no, they didn't. <laughs> you're like, okay, um, you're, you're open to that. Um, someone says, I believe the Lord gave me a prophecy for you. You're like, okay, let me hear it. You're not thinking, no, he didn't. So I'm charismatic in that sense. You, you believe in the gifts, the charisma. But hyper charismatic means you do it in a way that's too much or just wrong in some fashion. Um, and that's what hyper charismatic is meant to say. There's some sense in which you go too far. So what's too far look like? Well, maybe it means you've got the whole room speak, speaking in tongues all at once, all out loud, and an unbeliever comes in and they hear you and they go, we think you're crazy. You're doing this without interpretation. I mean, that's actually what Paul says not to do in 1 Corinthians 14. He's like, don't speak in tongues without interpretation and a bunch of people just doing that. Unbelievers are going to come in and think you're crazy or even anybody uninformed. Even a Christian who just doesn't understand what's going on, it's going to think you're all crazy. And what do people think when they see that? They think you're crazy. So Paul was right. That's maybe hyper charismatic or hyper charismatic might be looking for um, spiritual things in every single location. Like I've heard people say like, every dream is a prophecy. Every dream is a prophecy. And I'm like, yeah, that feels like hyper charismatic to me. Every dream is a prophecy or every, everything that happens, like you wake up in the morning and the, the song on the radio, whatever it is, you're like, I think that must be prophetic. And then I go around and my, 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 my fortune cookie is going to be prophetic and everything's prophetic. I think that that would be hyper, meaning your, your, your sensitivity to things is, is inflamed. It's, it's, it's too much. And so that you have all these false positives and you think are the move of the spirit that are not, that would be my, my thought on hyper charismatic and it can be unhealthy because you can actually be thinking and if you aren't like me hyper charismatic you're not really a christian you're you're quenching the spirit and you're not really saved that would be a dangerous version of that that's my thought all right number 16 this is hans mo who says ezekiel 18 20 says the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father how do you explain the story of achan in joshua 7 25 where him and his household were stoned 
and burned because of his sin. Let's look at the passage. Um, so you, you, you correctly, yeah, you, Ezekiel saying you don't, this is, this is God setting up the laws of Israel in your, in your governmental laws, Israel, you don't punish the children for the father. Now there's times where kids get, they suffer, um, you would call like collateral damage. For instance, if, if the father goes to prison, obviously this impacts the kids, but the, the, the kids being impacted or hurt, but he's not actually being punished, right? The punishment's not directed at the, at the child there, but they're being hurt. If the father steals from his job and and he spends a week in jail and he loses his job like the whole family suffers but it, but they're not being punished he's being punished they're suffering there's a difference okay but here's the passage though in um Joshua 7:25 so Joshua said uh what did you uh let me back up I, I should just give us the whole context um well maybe not the whole context <laughs> um Okay, um, so Israel has sinned. Verse 11, we'll start here. They've transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. So they just lost a battle because they they have sin and God's favor is not on them right now. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they've become devoted for destruction. So the, they should have destroyed these items they stole that God said, when you, when you take the city, destroy everything. They didn't destroy it. They took some of it. So now Israel's the one that'll be destroyed. Uh, I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. It's trying to serve God and, and harbor sin in your life too. It doesn't work. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot, that's like a random uh, selection process, shall come near by clans. So they're trusting the Lord to guide that process. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household the Lord takes shall come near by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he's done an outrageous thing in Israel. Now, consistently in the Bible, the first people to violate a new sort of, you know, set a system that God brings up, the first people to violate it get extreme consequences to show how big of a deal it is. This is my opinion that they're violating that. So a New Testament example is Ananias and Sapphira. They lied. They, they held back money and lied to everybody and tried to deceive about how much they were giving, which they didn't have to give at all, but they, they, they chose to and lied about it and they're struck dead. Now, God doesn't do this with every other liar in, in the church. He does initially to set a standard so people with shock go, whoa, this is a big deal. Okay, it's a big deal not to compromise. Um, Moses, when he gave the Sabbath laws, there was a man who was gathering sticks on the Sunday and he's doing this. Uh, it seems in deliberate violation, kind of like sticking his fist at God as he does it. Um, as you read the text, that seems implied. He's doing it as a way of rebelling against God. And so he gets stoned and... Um, the, the extreme reaction to show how bad sin is. The reason we don't like these extreme reactions is because in our culture, even Christians, we generally don't think sin is that bad. Well, that seems rather extreme. Well, that seems rather extreme. And our perceptions are wrong here. We, we, we have a weak understanding of righteousness. And so we have a weak understanding of sin. Anyways, this being said, uh, verse 16, Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe and the tribe of Judah was taken and he brought near the clans of Judah and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. So we're narrowing it down to figure out who's the culprit. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man and Zabdi was taken and he brought near his household man by man and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. All right, we're narrowing it down. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. Notice he hid it the whole time. He never came forward. He hid it all the way through the selection process, just kind of hoping he wouldn't get caught. And Achan answered Joshua, truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil, a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. This is important. Let's remember where they were hidden. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent 
and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid down, laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? Hold on one second. I'm going to check something. I'll tell you if it's important after I check it. Forgive me for being vague. <sighs> okay. Um, it is it is important. Uh, okay, something I didn't know before. All right, so uh, Joshua says, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. So they're all killed. Like, why, why is the whole family being punished for something that just one guy did? Now, we know it's his sons and daughters. It doesn't say their age, okay? Like, if you want to project, oh, it was a one-year-old. Like, you can make that up in your head if you want. But you're, and then, and, and then, and interpret it as like, this, this is clearly an example of God being wrong. Like, you can do that if you want, but you're just making stuff up in your head for a preferred interpretation. Instead, these people seem accountable. Where, here's, here's some reasons. Where is it found? In his tent. Who's in his tent? His family. They're traveling as families. Tent, your whole family is with you in the tent. And it's buried there in the tent. The whole family seems to know about this. And they all kept it hidden. Achan was selected not because he was the only one that knew, but because he's the head of the whole family who was involved in this conspiracy. That seems supported by the idea that in chapter 7, verse 25, he says, why did you bring trouble on us? It's plural. Not singular. That was what I checked. <laughs> so it's plural, meaning that his family was all involved. So Ezekiel is 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 kept intact, so to speak. That rule is kept intact because the family is being punished for what they did. Aiken's the, the figurehead of the family, so he's pulled out, isolated as, as more responsible. But they're all responsible. And so they all receive the same punishment. Um, and what they did resulted in the death of many people and they kept it hidden until they were finally forced, um, and exposed. So I think that that's, uh, yeah, I think that's your answer. Let's go to 17. Um, Daniel DeBoard says, did Yahweh lose to the God of Moab in second Kings three twenty seven? Let's look at that verse and think about it. Second Kings three twenty seven. And he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came a great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. I need to read more of the passage. I might not even have a quick answer for you here, but let's just read it so we can all think about it together. Um, and it's just one of those things where you just got to read a lot, I think, to get the full context. So here's Second uh, Kings 3. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Ahab became king over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 12 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as most of them did, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal in his father, his, that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. Now, Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. He's not going to give his, his tribute. So King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at the time and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go out with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. Then he said, by which way shall we march? Jehoram answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the northern and southern kingdoms are going to work together to go against Moab here. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And when they had made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. Like we're, <laughs> we're doomed. Like, so an army marches on its stomach. It's been said, you know, you 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 run out of water. You don't. There's no fresh water in the spring. You thought was going to have it on your way there. Like that's a really serious issue. 
So Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the kings, uh, then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, um, Elijah, the son of Shaphat is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elijah said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. This is his way of rebuking the king of Israel, because like it, the chapter started, he did evil in the sight of God. Um, so he's not serving God. This is him going, oh, uh, we need water. Uh, let's try the, let's try the, the, the God one. Let's try the, the Yahweh guy. Let's try that guy. Like, that's how it comes off, right? Um, but the king of Israel said to him, no, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hands of Moab. So he's like, I think that God's the one behind this genuinely. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Right? Judah had some good kings. Israel didn't have a single good one. As far as the northern and southern kingdoms when they split. But now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. That's such an interesting verse. You'd think that that was written by a hyper charismatic or something, but it's not. It's just when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink. You, your livestock, and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. It's easy for God to do it. He will also give the Moabites into your hand and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop up all the springs of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. The next morning about the time of the offering the sa of the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom till the country was filled with water. So it was just like a river from some upstream event happening. There was a bunch of water that came. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called out and were drawn up at the border. And when they rose early in the morning uh, and the sun shone on the water, the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have, have surely fought together and struck one another down. So there's some kind of delusion that these are having. Like like they're, they're, they're deceived here. Um, and they think, ah, let's go get the spoil. They're not running out for battle. They're running out for spoil. Figured that the armies turned on each other, which could happen, right? You tell your buddy, let's go out and fight together. And you stab him in the back. That's basically the idea. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites till they fled from before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities. And on every good piece of land, every man threw a stone until it was covered. They stopped every spring of water and filled all the good trees till only its stones were left in Kir Hareseth. And the slingers surrounded and attacked it. But, um, excuse me, there's no but there. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. So we've got kind of the context of the whole battle. Uh, I haven't spent time on this question before, so I don't have like a well thought out answer for you. I just want to at least, if we're thinking biblically requires reading scripture. So I understand the question. You're like, this son, this guy's losing, right? He's losing. And he takes his oldest son, and it seems to be the king, the, the, the Moabite king, it seems, from what I'm reading here, maybe I'm wrong. He takes his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offers him for a burnt offering on the wall. And then great wrath comes against Israel. From who? Wrath from who? And so you, someone might say, well, maybe from whatever evil spirit is behind the 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 thing that the king of moab is worshiping um uh, the, the you know there are fallen angels there are evil spirits there are activities that they do in the world they really do fight against the purposes of god so you could say that that's what happened i don't know if that's what happened okay or you could say that that wrath came from god against israel but if the wrath is somehow causally related to the event that just happened then it would seem that the wrath comes from some sort of evil source and that there was a general a spiritual battle going on behind the physical battle between the two militaries. Let's say that that's the case. Hypothetically, maybe I'll change my mind if I study this more and think about it more. But let's say hypothetically that's the case. How would you interpret this? Would you, as your question asks, um, would we conclude that Yahweh lost to the God of, of Moab? 
And I would think this is where I would back off and say, if you read the Bible, any book of the Bible, you will see that God never loses to these other kings. But there are many times where Israel loses because they don't have the favor of God or the full favor of God. It's Israel that loses. And there's, there's even examples where God tries to draw this out so we can dr- drill this down. And the, the, when, when um, King Saul brings the Ark of the Covenant out to fight against the Philistines, this is because God can't lose against the Philistine gods. They're Dagon, they're fish head God, right? He can't lose against their Philistine gods. And God allows the Ark of the Covenant to be captured and for the Israelites to lose this battle. But And if someone goes, does that mean God lost against Dagon? This is clearly the wrong answer because they put this ark inside the temple of Dagon. And what happens is every day, another piece of Dagon breaks off and he falls over face forward. The the idol falls to prove that God didn't lose. Israel lost. God let them lose. But don't you for a second think that any power could win against God. So Israel lost for other reasons, not because of some overpowering, somebody overpowering God. Then God even gives them hemorrhoids. It's a very interesting story. (laughs) And... He has them get all these problems until the Philistines, with no army of Israel, they just send, they just send the ark back. Just go back to Israel, please leave us alone, because they realize we might beat Israel, but we cannot defeat God. No one can defeat God. He's He's God of all. He's the Lord of all creation. So, you should interpret anything that happens in the context of Scripture in the light of these clear indications of God's sovereignty over all and His His om, His omnipotence. And he's, there's no other no God like Him. Um. So if this wrath came against Israel it, it, from this sort of Moabite false god, uh, not a true god or deity, but, but, but whoever is sort of driving the worship of the spiritual being is behind the worship of this false god, then I would conclude it happened after God did what he said and helped Israel. But we know that Israel was in a, um, um, they even covered this, the dirt, the ground with stones and did all kinds of stuff, right? They stopped the springs of water. They filled, fell the good trees. They did all this stuff. Um, so why was it there? And I'll offer another theory here at the end. I'm just thinking of that might be relevant. Okay. I'm just thinking out loud here. Forgive me for anybody who thinks that's reckless. Don't take it as my final answer. I'm just working it with you. Um, so what we, uh, I started a sentence there and I don't know how I was going to finish it. <laughs> what we see here is that, um, Potentially, Israel accomplishes the the thing that they came to do, and God's like, I'm going to help you because you reached out and you you cried to me for help. But then after God does what he says, then God's help withdraws, and that's when they had Israel said, okay, we're out of here, we flee. God did what he said he was going to do, he gave us the victory, but but now we're out of here, we're going to flee. The other thing, though, that, that, that hits me that could be completely unrelated to the Moabite God and all that spiritual battle stuff is that the king of Moab... When he offered up his own son, his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, may have been giving up his legacy. And it may be that because the, the order to the Israelites is drive them out, not, not that the Moabites have to all be killed, but they have to be driven from the land. You don't have this land anymore. I'm giving it to my people. It's not yours. It's, it's, it's mine. And it's being given to them. That when the Moabite king does this, even though it was a wrong thing to do, it was the moment where he, because God doesn't approve of human sacrifice or any of that kind of stuff, but it was the moment where he gave up his future, his future kingship, his future reigning. And so the land had been messed up and his legacy has been ruined. And so there's no longer a reason to pursue them. And so now the deliverance aspect is taken care of. So Israel still has their sin issues. And maybe that's when wrath came against Israel um, because it's no longer about Moab. Now it's about Israel and their rebellion because, because, Jehoshaphat was a wicked king. There's a theory for you. You can think of it. And maybe I'll keep thinking of it. Grace Walton has a question. Is there a literal example, or is there a little literal temple in heaven, or is it meant to be understood figuratively? I've always understood that the temple tabernacle on earth were to represent truths about heaven. I take it to be um, figurative, but I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, think about Paul when he says, I was caught up in, into the third heaven. By the way, he just means like there's sky, there's like space, and then there's God's heaven. We usually use the word heaven for that, right? He's caught up to the third heaven and, and he goes, I don't know if it was in the body or out of the body. And it, it, I, I almost feel like you're asking me and I feel a little bit like Paul. I was never caught up anywhere, but I, I feel like, I, go, I don't know if it's literal or figurative. I'm not entirely sure. I lean figurative, 
but I, but I'm, I don't know. And lots of scripture can weigh on on this. Hebrews talks about this. Maybe I'll talk about it when I go through Hebrews um, here, uh, which I'll start doing later this year, um, verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. So, yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. 19, anonymous question. My husband likes to spend hours on meaningless videos or gaming. Um, how can I talk to him about how he spends his time as a Christian, especially that our young kids see this? Thank you. Um, yeah. Th this is just a very personal. You're his wife. You know your husband. You probably have an idea of the better and worse ways to approach him. You need to use the wisdom you've gained in your years of marriage. You've learned your husband. If there's certain affirmations you can make, honey, this, 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 before you bring up the issue, or if there's ways of bringing up the issue, or maybe you need to hint at it, or maybe you need to bring it up once and not mention it again for a long time. Like, I, you know your husband, may God give you wisdom, I just don't know how to, except, except to say Galatians 6 is the verse that always occurs to me when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, and, and to be honest, it is an issue if, if he's spending countless hours on meaningless things, it's pulling him away from family, and it's, it's, it's too much, okay? This is an issue for a lot of us, okay? Not that I've ever had a problem with any of this sort of thing, ever, never, never, not once, never, frequently. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a major issue, and we need to be aware of it, but awareness as part of it is, is just seeing yourself as that person who's wasting all that time. At any rate, um, you who are spiritual, okay, that's not an insult. Like, like hey, you're, you're spiritual. Like, you, there's, a, there's a good quality you have. You're actually being spiritual on this topic. You should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Approach him with a spirit of gentleness. Try to add gentleness to, to, to the way that you approach him. This is a healthy thing to do, no matter who you're approaching, to correct them. Keep watching yourself too, lest you be tempted. That's the second thing. Make sure that as you approach him, you don't fall into sin where you start like, piling on every complaint you can think of or something like that. I'm not saying you would, but you know, there's all these temptations we have, like where, when we're confronting somebody with an issue where we go over the, we go overboard, we go too far, we exaggerate the issue. We, we make it bigger than it. Instead of putting a light on it, we put a magnifying glass on it and then it ends up being a, a point of conflict. So yeah, that's about all I can think to share with you just now. Edward Vasquez says, how is it important to read our Bibles other than a church setting? And is there scripture to back it up? And why is it important to, to you to read your Bible? Um, well, let me answer those questions one at a time. How important is it? How is it important to read our Bibles other than at a church setting? Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, where in scripture does it suggest that we isolate our reading of scripture and our talking of scripture and our knowledge of scripture to g church gatherings? The answer there is never. It never does that. The Bible never suggests that you should only read the Bible when you're in church. And for anyone to suggest, I'm not saying you're suggesting this, Edward, at all. You're asking questions. Doesn't mean it's your opinion about things. Um, so, so the Bible never suggests this. But when you read things like Psalm 119, I was I was listening to the Psalms the other day. I was listening to, and through Psalm 119 as well, you l go read Psalm 119 and then, and then add at the end when you're in church, <laughs> right? Blessed is the one who, who delights in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night scripture says. And, but what I, but I mean by that is while you're in church, <laughs> right? That's Psalm one <laughs> while you're in church, you know, in Deuteronomy where he tells him, talk about these scriptures. Talk about them when you're on the way. Raise your children with them. Teach them the, the way of God. Raise them in the ways of the Lord. And it's like, when you're in church. Like, you, you just can't add a when you're in church and be reasonable about it. Jesus went around preaching everywhere he went, teaching everywhere he went. To be his disciple, you couldn't show up once a week. You had to follow him all over the place because he didn't just do it in church. Paul is teaching in church, but he's also teaching all the time during the week. He's just preaching long sermons and stuff. And people are spending time with him and coming to him and... Um, you know, Philip doesn't respond to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts. Hey, I, I, I want to understand this Bible passage in Isaiah. Like, who is this suffering servant? And Philip goes, you know, it's not, it's not church day. It's not church day today. Can we talk about this some other time? Um, it, it's just so weird. So reading on, you said, 
Is there scripture to back it up? I, I think I shared several verses for you there. We delight in the law of God, in the word of God. We rejoice in scripture. We meditate on these things. We give ourselves over to these things. Paul wrote letters to the churches, but he didn't want them to only think about them while they're in church. And they were to share them with each other. And it, it, there's just nothing about the context of scripture that suggests it's isolated to, you know, in church setting. Um, why is it important for me to read the Bible to myself personally? Well, I noticed that when I don't read scripture, I spiritually suffer. Uh, like it's just something I've noticed in my life. I genuinely do. I, I remember there was a season where I just, I generally would only read the Bible when I was in church and maybe like listening to some Bible studies on, on the radio. Um, back when I was like a late teen, I think it was. And I started to get into that and I thought I was fine. I was like, I don't need to read the Bible every day. People are like, read the Bible every day and make a big deal about it. And I was like, I don't think I need to. Like I listen to Bible studies. But when I started having a practice of daily reading the scriptures, prayer and reading, I noticed my spiritual health accelerate. Like I just, I became just more spiritually healthy, happy, joyous, spiritually, spiritual minded, able to handle temptation and difficulties. And then when I let that fall off, I, there's a corresponding suffering that I go through, spiritually speaking. So in a pragmatic sense, I notice a, a real impact on my life that it has as you do this as a daily practice. There's other benefits too. Um, there's many, many benefits to the word of God. Read Psalm 119. That's that's the best advice I give to you guys. Just read Psalm 119 and ask yourself this. Should I isolate my my Bible reading? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear my cat. Uh, to, uh, you know, to, to just what I do in church. The answer is no. Um, now, some would re re would push back on me and go, but Mike, it's not like they had their own Bibles. It's not like they had their own Bibles. But this is why, where in cultures where there's less Bibles, less full Bibles where people have their own, their own Bible and they have to like get together and have the Bible read, in those cultures, people memorize the scriptures. They memorize and repeat them and talk about them and discuss them. And those same cultures, here, here's, a, here's a little moxie appearance for you guys. <laughs> she hasn't showed up in a long time. Those same um, people who don't have a Bible, if they heard you say, I'm not going to read my Bible because Joe Schmo in the first century didn't have their own Bible, they would die hearing you say that. If they had their own scripture, do you think they would be like, well, I just don't feel like reading it? No, they wouldn't. That would be wrong. Okay. Anyway, th those are my all my answers on that word. I hope it helps you guys. Let's um, let's pray. Thanks for the extra, extra sticking around for the extra long stream today. I will be doing one next Friday, and it, and next Friday it's it's all about non Christian questions. Now that means questions from non believers or from people where the question is the kind of question a non believer would ask, and maybe you've dealt with it, and you'd like to hear some thoughts on it. And I'll give you the best answers I can, uh, you know, off the top of my head. So let's let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We pray that you give us a appreciation for scripture, appreciation for the word of God. That is so high that that we wouldn't ask questions like maybe 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 I can just read it when I'm in church only. <laughs> that we would love the word of God because we would see that it, it is light into our steps. It is it is health and strength to our bones. It is um it is where your Holy Spirit works in us just as we read the word. It's the sword of the Spirit. We we love you. We love your word, and we want to stir that up more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.